Okay, so that covers uh, the basic uh, set of uh, queries. We are going to come back uh, later in chapter 4 and cover outer joins and other kinds of queries. But before we do that, I want to cover modification of the database. Uh, so, there is the delete operation. Delete from instructor, what does it do? Wipes out all instructors, all tuples from instructor, which is different from drop ping the table instructor. Delete from instructor retains the table, removes all tuples. If you drop the table, the table itself is gone. Now, you may want to do something less drastic and delete only instructors from the finance department. Now, here is our next query which says delete all tuples in the instructor relation for those instructors who are in a department which is located in the Watson building. So, not only do we you know want to delete one department, we want to delete how many of our departments are located in the Watson building. Now, if you remember the schema, if you have it with you, you will notice that department has a building name. So, we are assuming that each department has a building. A department cannot have two buildings, that is not important here. So, each department has one building, but more than one department can be in the same building and we want to wipe out all those departments which happen to be in the Watson building. So, we can say delete from instructor where department name in select department name from department where building is Watson. So, here is a sub query connected with an in clause which lets us choose which department uh, which instructors to delete. Now, here is another query which is interesting. Delete all instructors whose salary is less than the average salary of instructors. So, how do we do this? Well, here is a simple way of writing it. Delete from instructor where salary less than select average salary from instructor. Note that this is a scalar sub query because it returns a single value is used in an expression where you expect a single value the right hand side of less than would be a single value here. So, now average salary for instructor is a single value. Well, technically the sub query returns a single tuple with a single attribute whose value is the average salary, but in SQL you can use it in a place where a single value is expected uh, and it automatically gets the value out of the tuple in comparison. So, if you are familiar with type systems in programming languages these two types are different. The right side of less than is a set having a single tuple with a single attribute. The left side is a value, but the type is automatically cast by the less than operation. The type conversion happens automatically. So, now uh, if you did this in a naive way, if you executed this in a naive way, uh, you first take the first instructor, check the average salary, check if the salary is less, then delete that instructor. Now, get the next instructor again compute the average salary. Now, there is a problem. If you deleted the first instructor, the average has changed. So, now depending on the order in which you chose the instructors, you may delete a completely different set of instructors. That would be a very, very uh, bad situation. You do not want that. So, in SQL, the semantics of these deletes are slightly different. It is not, you cannot evaluate the subquery again and again after doing deletions. Instead, conceptually what you do is first compute the average salary and find all the tuples to be deleted based on the average salary. At this point, no deletion is to be done. The same with other things, insert and so on. First compute the set, do not actually do anything. After you found out which all tuples to delete, you can go ahead and do the deletion. At this point, we are not again computing averages, we have already chosen which all to delete using the original average and that is it. Afterwards, we finish the deletion. So, that is how the semantics is defined. Now, it should be clear that regardless of the order in which you consider a tuple, this does not matter. We computed the average already before deleting any tuple. Okay. Now, insertion, uh, again there is, uh, this shows you multiple syntax variations for doing insertion. The one we saw so far was insert into course values and then list the values in the standard order which was uh, done when we created the table. So, this is what we saw. The second one is an alternative where we say insert into course, we list the attributes explicitly in whatever order we choose and then we provide the values in the same order. Now, why is this useful? Um, because we can now go and modify the table 
uh, course and add a new attribute let us say a comment or something. Now, what happens to this insert statement? The first one will fail because now course has 5 attributes, but this has only 4 attributes. This one would actually succeed because we have explicitly given the 4 attributes. The fifth attribute which we have not specified will get some default value. If you do nothing, it gets a value null. You can also declare in the table what is the default value. If so, it will get the default value if you do not specify it. Now, here is another example. If you want to insert a value null, you can type null over here. So, if the uh, total credits for a student is set to null, I have to type null. Note that I should not put a quote. If I say quote null quote, that is actually the string null. By just saying null, it means a null value special. Now, the insert statement can actually take a, a query in there and take the entire set of results of the query and insert it into a new table. So, here is the one thing which says instruct into student select id name department name 0 from instructor. What is it doing? It is turning every instructor into a student whose total credits value is 0. Now, this is not very meaningful, but it shows you the syntax for computing the results of a query and then inserting them all at once into another relation. This is related to the uh, question which somebody had asked earlier on chat, which was what if you want to insert a set of values. If that set of values is already in the database and I can get it by running a subquery like this, this is the syntax. If that set of values is outside of the database, then that is when you need to use uh, uh, either a series of insert statements or a special uh, bulk load facility which is database dependent. Now, again um, the statement here is fully evaluated before any insert happens, otherwise we will run into trouble. So, supposing uh, we say insert into table 1, select star from table 1 and let us say the table 1 does not have a primary key declaration. So, now if I am scanning table 1 and I insert a tuple and I continue scanning it to find other tuples. When I come to the end, I may find the tuple which I just inserted and I will insert that again and continuing the scan, I will find the newly inserted tuple and I will keep inserting again and again. I will go into an infinite loop, inserting the same tuple over and over, which is bad. So, the SQL language definition prevents this by saying, first compute the set of tuples which you want to insert, get that set and then do the insert at one go. So, you will not see the same tuples over and over. Of course, if I had a primary key, it would not matter, the primary key violation would occur right away. Here. And finally, updates, again there are um, many kinds of things you can do with updates. Here is a simple one, which gives a salary increase. Um, so, it says update instructor set salary is equal to salary times 1.03, where salary greater than 100,000. What is this doing? It is giving a 3 percent raise of salary to all those with high salaries. What about those with lower salaries less than 100,000? They have chosen to give it a 5 percent raise. So, the salary is set to salary times 1.05. So, that is uh, how you give differential raise to different employees. But this particular update is tricky. Supposing I flip the two statements, I first did the one which updated the salary of those less than 100,000 and then did the second think what will happen. Supposing somebody's salary was 96 or 97,000, I give that person a 5 percent raise, boom, their salary is now more than 100,000. Now, if I run the, this first one, if I run it second, it is going to find their salary is greater than 100,000 and it is going to give them one more raise of 3 percent. They will be very happy, but uh, others are not going to be happy seeing them getting a double raise. So, that is an error. So, it is a little risky to write uh, multiple updates like this if you are not careful. So, in this particular case, a um, much better way of writing it is using a case construct. A case construct is uh, sort of like the question mark colon operator in uh, C language uh, and what does it do? Let us just look at the case construct here. Case when salary less than 100,000, then salary star 1.5, else salary star 1.3 the case construct is returning a value. Now, if you know the C language, the case statement there is slightly different. The case statement executes one of the statements in the case. It does not return a value per se. 
although it could be used to return a value. Here, the case statement returns a value and returns one of these values depending on which of these conditions. So, if this is satisfied, it returns this else that. So, now look at the main query, update instructor, set salary equal to case when this, then this, else this end. Note that this is very safe. I am just doing one scan of the relation. Depending on which condition is satisfied, I give a 5 percent raise or a 3 percent raise. It is safer than the previous one. It is also more efficient. So, that is a very useful construct. And finally, here are a few updates which would be basically impossible unless we use scalar subqueries. So, here is this query. If you recall the schema, every student had an attribute called total credits or tot under credits, which is the total number of credits which they have completed successfully, meaning they passed the course. Now, if you see the uh, sample tables which we have provided in the book, you will realize as many students did that the total credits do not match. And the reason this happened was uh, we uh, you know reduce the number of rows in the takes table to keep it small and then the total credits do not match that. So, there are rows which we did not put in the takes table. Supposing I want to update the total credits for all students based on the actual rows in the takes table. I can write a query to do that. How do I find the actual total credits for each student? Um, now, let us just look at the subquery. That should help you see what is happening. Um, to find the credits, I have to join takes with course, because the credit attribute is not there in the takes. Only the course ID is there. But each course can have a different number of credits. I have to join with course. So, takes natural join course. Now, takes natural join course gives me rows for all students. I want it for a particular student. In this case, for the, the uh, specific outer level student I am considering here. So, I am saying update student s and in here where s dot id equal to takes dot id. So, first of all I am filtering out all the rows which do not correspond to this student. Now, this student may also have taken a course and failed it. I do not want to count the credits for such takes instances. So, I am going to say and takes dot grade not equal to f. Now, furthermore this person may have taken the course, but no grade has been allocated yet, because the semester is going on. So, grade is not yet meaningful. So, grade may be null. I want to eliminate those also. So, I am saying and takes dot grade is not null. So, what will be left is only those where the grade is not null and it is not f. So, I am going to sum up those credits and the update statement is actually setting the total tot under credit for this uh, student equal to the result of this subquery. So, this is a scalar subquery, which is now being used to update the total credits attribute of the student. I hope this was clear, um, but there are a couple of issues here. So, first of all, if somebody has not taken any course or um, maybe they took a course, but it grade is still null or they have taken a course, but they have not passed it. In which case, what happens? This subquery returns an empty set. So, what is sum on an empty set? If you recall our aggregate discussion, sum on an empty set is null. Count is 0, but sum is null. So, the total credits for the student would be set to null. It would not be set to 0. So, if you want to set it to 0, what do we do? We can use the following case statement. You can say, case when some credits is not null, then some credits else 0. So, that takes care of uh, handling the case where if it was null, it will be set to 0. So, I hope this query is clear. Um, so, that is it for now, but we will take time for a few questions. Okay, mm, we have a few people with their hands raised. Let us try NIT Warangal. NIT Warangal, if you have a question, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. There are two questions from my side. Yeah. Uh, first question is uh, regarding deletion. Uh, how to delete duplicate rows from the table? Okay. Okay. So, how do you uh, 
do this, it is actually a little tricky because if you delete one row, the other will also get deleted because when you say declaratively delete something, whatever condition you give, all the duplicates will satisfy that condition. So, the only way to delete duplicate rows is to first make a copy of the rows of uh, uh, in that relation in some other uh, table, temporary table. So, you can say select distinct star from this table and save it up in something else and then wipe out the contents of the table, delete all the rows and then insert the remaining rows back into that table. That is the only way you can actually do it in SQL. Now, there are tricks which a few databases offer which let you access row IDs and so on which can help you uh, distinct you know pick the minimum row ID among all rows which are equal on all the other attributes. Uh, so, if your database supports those features there are other ways of doing it, but in the standard SQL there is no other way of doing it. So, if you if it does for example, PostgreSQL has a row ID. So, I can delete uh, everything except the minimum row ID uh, for a particular value for the remaining thing. So, I will delete where the row ID is not equal to select minimum row ID from the same relation where all the attributes are equal. So, that that is not too hard to do. Okay. Does that answer your question? Sir, regarding the assignment uh, uh, 1 uh, like yesterday's assignment, uh, question number 3, uh, can I ask uh, some question regarding that? Sir? Okay. Okay. The question goes like this sir, find the ID and name of instructors who have taught a course in computer science department, even if they are themselves not from the computer science department. Okay. So, the point of this question was if you did a natural join uh, across all of the relations involved, it would make the uh, department name of the instructor equal to the department name of the course. We discussed this question during the slides for uh, earlier in this chapter 3. So, the question was basically to make sure you took care of that. Uh, so, does that answer whatever doubt you had or did you have some other doubt? Uh, what is the difference between delete and truncate? Okay. Uh, delete and uh, trun truncate is not a part of standard SQL, uh, it is uh, part of uh, Oracle and uh, delete you know lets you specify which rows you want to delete. Truncate says just wipe out all the rows of the table. Um, so, it is just extra oracle syntax. Now, the way they execute it is probably a little bit uh, different, uh, but conceptually as far as I know I, I, I have not used the truncate very much, but as far as I recall uh, it is equivalent to just deleting all rows. There may be some other minor differences, but it is not standard SQL. Uh, when we copy the uh, structure of a database to another structure, do the constraints also get copied? Uh, that is a good question. When you copy the structure, so the question is how do you copy the structure? Depends on how you do that. Now, if you uh, you know export the schema uh, and then reload it, you can export the schema in SQL which uh, lets you uh, uh, you know save all the constraints including foreign key, primary key, everything is saved. However, if you do something like uh, you know create table as select star from another table, that is a way to copy a table and create a new table uh, with the same columns and the same types as the first table. Um, so, this is supported in many databases, it was not there in standard SQL earlier, I think it is there now and it is widely supported create table as select from star from something else. The problem with this is it does not preserve the constraints, the newly created table does not inherit any of the primary key or foreign key constraints from the original table. Does that answer your question? Hello. Thank you sir. Okay. So, now let us move to some other uh, place which still wants a question. VNIT Nagpur still has its hand raised. So, let us see. If yes, I can see you VNIT Nagpur. Go ahead. If a query involves where clause having clause, order by clause and group by clause, then what was the execution plan of the query processor? That means, which clause will execute first and why? Yeah, that is a good question. If there are multiple clauses, what is the order in which they are considered? So, the SQL language defines the order like this. 
first is the from clause that is central that lists the relations which are involved. So, conceptually the first step is to take the cross product. Now, the actual execution plan may rearrange things as long as the result is the same, but to understand what the query means first take the cross product of whatever is in the from clause, then apply the where clause to filter out rows which do not satisfy it. Of course, a good implementation would actually uh, combine these two steps by doing a join on a condition rather than just taking a cross product. Now, once you have got a set of rows, um, if there is a group by clause that is applied to do a grouping and then the select clause can be evaluated. Uh, if uh, the select clause has aggregates, it would be one row per group. If it does not have aggregates, uh, then uh, you know if there is no group by clause and there is an aggregate, it will be just one row. If there is no group by clause and no aggregates, the select is applied to get whatever you have. Now, if you had a group by, you could optionally have a having clause. So, after you compute the aggregate in the select clause, you can apply the having clause and filter out those things in the results of the select which fail the having clause. And finally, if there is an order by clause that is applied to order the result. So, that is the order in which these happen conceptually. Now, a good query optimizer may actually mix up these steps uh, and to get a faster plan provided the result is the same. Does that answer your question? Any other questions from VNIT? Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, thank you. Let's see if anybody else is, has the question raised. There's one from Amrita Bangalore. Sir, uh, can you explain the query? Find all the students who have taken all the courses offered in the biology department. That slide once again. Okay, that's a good question uh, because many people may have been confused by that. So let's go back to. Okay, I hope you can uh, see this slide up which says find all students who have taken all the courses offered in the biology department. So, first of all I hope the query itself is clear. Um, the biology department may offer multiple courses. Certain students may have taken all of those courses. I want them. I do not want those who have taken 0 or 1 or 2, but those who have taken all the courses which are offered by the biology department. So, this kind of a query which requires things which uh, have the for all form that is I am returning students such that for all courses in biology, they have taken that course. That is what the question says. Now, how do I write that question? Since SQL does not have a for all construct, but it has a not exist construct, I am going to use double negation. What is double negation here? If you say this is true for all things, it is the same as saying there does not exist the thing for which this is not true. So, I want to find students such that there does not exist a biology course that they have not taken. So, that is the basic way in which you write such queries in SQL. Now, do not ask me why does SQL not have a for all construct. Uh, I do not know the answer to that. The standards bodies decide that, but you can work around it although it is a little confusing at first, but you will get used to it. So, what we are doing is find students such that there does not exist a course in biology that the student has not taken. So, not exists course in biology is the first part select course ID from course where department name is biology which the student has not taken. So, I want to remove from these courses all those which the student has taken. So, if I take the courses in biology and remove all the courses the student has taken what is left is the biology courses that the student has not taken. If this set is empty then the not exist condition will be true and the student will be output which is correct. But if this set is not empty that means there is some biology course which this student did not take then the subquery result is not empty. So, the not exist condition here will fail and that student will not appear in the output. I hope that answered your question. Um, let me come back to you on yeah Amrita. Uh, it's back to you. Do you have any follow-up question? Yes, sir. Clear, sir. Thank you. Thank you.